All right. Well, let's turn to 1 Kings tonight in chapter 17. And uh, we now come to my absolute favorite part of the Old Testament, I think. And that is uh, this portion of 1 and 2 Kings. <clears throat> and, and you'll see very quickly, up to this point, it's been King so-and-so up here, King so-and-so down here, and back and forth, back and forth. But one of the things I want to remind you of that, that we've seen with each one of these kings after the, after the well, even before, uh, in the life of David, in the life of Solomon, and then after the split of the kingdoms, is we see God introducing these prophets. And so we met uh, Ahijah the Shilonite, and we've, we've seen some of these other prophets that God has sent. Well, <clears throat> something huge happened in chapter 16, and... Uh, that was, you can see there in chapter 16 and verse 30, Ahab the son of Omri did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. And it came to pass as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam the son of Nebat that he took to wife Jezebel the daughter of Ethbog, king of the Zidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. And he reared up an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria, and Ahab made a grove, and Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. And so with the introduction of Baal worship, Baal worship, into Israel, on the scene immediately comes Elijah. Now Elijah is a grown man when we meet him. And we don't know where he comes from. We don't have any background on him. Just boom, here he is. And so, so God's already been at work in Elijah's life, bringing him up to this point, uh, is, is the interesting thing. But, but just here in chapter 17, we just introduce Elijah. And during this portion of First and Second Kings, we're really going to see a whole lot more about Elijah and Elisha than we are about the kings. And so, so it's like God takes a magnifying glass and he, he zooms in, if you will, on these two particular prophets. And so uh, he's, he's going to do it at, at the time that the greatest idolatry has ever come into the land of Israel. At that moment, some of the greatest prophets that we see in the Bible, not the greatest, but some of the greatest. And, and it's just, here's the thing, before we even look at this today, I just want to encourage you, the darker it gets, the more God's light shines. And the, the background of the darkness of the world in which you live is, is, is what God uses to, to show his light shining. And that, that light shines in us. And so, so as we encounter dark days in our nation, uh, dark days of, of, <clears throat> of evil, I, I spent the morning today hanging out with three retired police officers. And we were working cows. And I... I love these guys. They're they're great. They're all believers, and so we have a we just have a great time visiting. But uh, one of the things that that's so interesting, and I kind of I kind of you know I give them a little bit about it. But I'm like you know you guys you guys spent your whole career tracking down these vile criminals peddling marijuana, and now it's legal. <laughs> and, and they all just roll their eyes. You know they're like. They, they just throw their hands up. It's like, you know, we, we, we worked and did our jobs and we did our best. And, and you know, the, they said we had cut a fat hog if we tracked down an eight ball of cocaine. He said, one of them said his son had just, their, their group that they're with had just made an arrest that was pounds and pounds and pounds of cocaine. Like, like 40 pounds of this stuff. And, and I'm sure you know. Hundreds, hundreds of pounds of this stuff, you know. And they said, they said, how much meth have you ever seen in one place? Oh, you know, this much, that much, the other. And they had just done this huge, massive meth bust. And so, so the, the darkness in our world, you know, our, our border is wide open. We've got all of that junk flowing into our country just, just readily. But I want, to just, I want you to think about this, especially as we study this portion of Scripture. At the darkest time in Israel's history, here comes God's man, and the light's going to shine in, in his life. So let's pick up there, chapter 17, verse 1. And Elijah, Elijah the Tishbite 
who was of the inhabitants of Gilead. Okay, so Gilead is on the eastern side of the Jordan River, and uh, Tashibe is probably the little town that he is from, and so he's from he's from the northeast portion over there where the Israelites uh, equipped Og, king of Bashan. That's the the area that Gilead is. That's where Elijah is from. And it says, and he uh, he said unto Ahab. Now remember, Ahab uh, and and uh, his daddy Omner, Omri established Samaria as the capital city of of Israel. And so Samaria is over here, Gilead is over here. So Elijah had to travel over here, go and confront Ahab. And this is what he says: As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Now, I, I want to stop before we look at the rest of this, and, and I want to show you something. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So where did Elijah get? You know, it doesn't tell us God said, Hey, Elijah, go tell Ahab this. Now, I'm sure that he did, but if you'll turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 11 real quick. <clears throat> In Deuteronomy chapter 11, God tells his people, Deuteronomy eleven sixteen. He says, Take heed to yourselves that your heart be not deceived, and ye turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. Well, is that that's what's happening in Israel, right? And then the Lord's wrath be kindled against you, and he shut up the heaven, that there be no rain, that the land yield not her fruit, lest you perish quickly from off the good land which the Lord giveth you. So Elijah has the word of God and one of the promises that God makes is is if you worship idols I will shut up the heavens and so God is going to use Elijah in a powerful way to do this so he goes and makes this announcement to the king how terrifying can you imagine can you imagine going to Biden right now and saying look unless you stop worshiping idols God's not it's not going to rain in America I mean that would be terrible but that's what, that's what he does. So verse 2, it says, And the word of the Lord came unto him, unto Elijah, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Kerith. That is before Jordan. So right after he does this, he tells Ahab, this is what's going to happen. God says, now go hide. Why do you think he's got to go hide? Because Ahab's going to try to kill him. You remember a few uh, months back or a month or so back, we studied Jeremiah on a Sunday morning. And that's exactly what Jeremiah and Baruch had to do. After Jeremiah wrote, uh, had Baruch write the, the word of the Lord on the scroll, and he took it and read it to the king, they said, Ooh, you better go hide. <laughs> when the king hears this, he's not going to like this. And so God tells the prophet to go and hide. And unfortunately, sometimes a part of ministry is just that. It's, it's basically very lonely very quiet and and it's hidden and it's just you and God and so verse 4 says and it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there so he went and did according to the word of the Lord for he went and dwelt by the brook Karen that is before Jordan and the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning and bread and flesh in the evening and he drank of the brook <laughs> And, you know, I mean, I mean, we read this, and, and this is one of those places that lots of people who scoff at the Bible, they say, oh, this is ridiculous, this is foolishness. But, but what, what we see is, and let's think about what's happening in Israel. Israel has turned their back on God. They, they have rejected God as their source. And he says, I gave you this land, and then you went and worshipped another God. I, I gave you your inheritance, and you went, and, and you... And, and they're worshiping Baal, the rain god, the thunder god. That's who they worship. And so that's one of the reasons why there's not going to be any rain. Because God is trying to show them, I control the rain. Not this false god that you're bowing down to and worshiping. And yet, at the same time, what they're doing in rejecting God is they're saying, God's not our source. God can't be trusted We've got to turn to some other source. And so as we study this tonight, I want you to think about your source because we're going to see it several times. And so, so what God is showing Elijah is, is God is his source and God can use any means necessary to provide for his people. And so he chooses to use unclean birds, 
Ravens are not, Israelites are not to, to, to mess with ravens. Raven is an unclean bird to an Israelite. There are other birds. I mean, he could have used the dove, right? But he doesn't. He uses the raven. And if you've ever been around a raven or a crow, a cousin to it, you want to talk about smart birds now. These are incredibly smart birds. So, and I'd also encourage you sometime to take your Bible and sit down and do a little thinking and think about how many animals God commands to do certain things in the Bible. God commanded a big fish to swallow Jonah. God spoke to uh, uh, Balaam through the, the donkey. Uh, you know, God commanded a worm to eat the, the plant that grew up around Jonah. There, there's all kinds of times when God commanded all the animals to go and load up when it was time to get on the ark. And so God sends these ravens. So every day they bring him a sandwich. Every morning, every evening. That's bread and flesh, right? That's a sandwich. So here they come. And he's got the water to drink. And, and yet, even in the midst of that, verse 7, it came to pass after a while, the brook dried up. So what this is showing you is that this is how bad the famine and drought in the land is. The drought is terrible, and so finally the brook dries up because there had been no rain in the land. So now Elijah's at another place. Is his source the ravens and the brook? No, his source is God. But God is working through the mechanism and the means. And you're the same way. Your, your job that you have, that is not your source. God is your source. Your job is a mechanism that he uses to bring income into your life. Your, your uh, uh, inheritance, that, that is not your source. Your parents that you are going to receive an inheritance from, that is not your source. God is your source. And that's what he's teaching Elijah and us and all the people of Israel in these chapters. I am your source. I can provide for you or not provide for you anyway. You can pray to the rain God all you want to, and he's not going to be able to do what I say is not going to happen. So when I say no rain, it doesn't matter who you pray to, it's not going to rain. But I can provide. And so there Elijah is. He's hiding, and the brook dries up. Now, the brook Carent is on the east side of the Jordan River, off over here in the southern part of Gilead okay so watch what he does now verse 9 arise get thee to Zarephath now Zarephath is in Zidon Lebanon up north so Elijah's gonna have to break his hiding he's gonna have to break his cover and travel all the way up to Zarephath hey guess who's in Zarephath Baal that's where Ahab's wife Jezebel that's where she's from that's where her daddy lives he's the king up there and so it's the center and the focus of Baal worship and a widow that lives in Zarephath is an unclean Gentile she is not an Israelite woman so God uses unclean birds to provide for his prophet and God uses this widow who is not an Israelite and he says here, he says, I want you to go up to Zarephath, which belongs to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. Let's stop and turn to Luke chapter 4. Because this woman actually makes the New Testament. <clears throat> it's really interesting. Jesus is in Nazareth. And he says in verse 24 of Luke chapter 4, Verily I say unto you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. The people at Nazareth, they were, you know, Jesus grew up there, and they're like, ah, this is the carpenter's kid, you know. And he says, but I tell you of a truth, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elias, that's Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, when great famine was throughout all the land, but unto none of them was Elias sent, save unto Sarepta, a city of Zidon, unto a woman that was a widow and many lepers were in Israel in the time of Eliseus, Elisha, the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, saving Naaman the Syrian. And verse 28 says, And they all in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath and rose up and thrust him out of the city, led him under the brow of the hill whereupon their city was built, that they might cast him down headlong. They, they hated him for saying this. Why? Because Jesus is saying, Look, not only can God use the Gentiles, God loves the Gentiles. God has a plan to bring the Gentiles into his covenant. 
and always has. Abraham was a Gentile, got started with a Gentile. Uh, Rahab, uh, Melchizedek, you just start going through and, and looking at all of the Gentiles that, that wind up believers. And so Jesus tells this story about Elijah being sent. So now I ask you the question, should we trust the story of Elijah? If we trust Jesus, we certainly should trust the story because he brings it up, right? And so, so he sends, he sends uh, Elijah up to Zarephath, to Zidon. And so he arose, he went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering of sticks. And he called her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, now look at the words that she uses. Verse 12, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. She calls him Jehovah. As Jehovah your God lives, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal and a barrel and a little oil and a cruise. And behold, I'm gathering two sticks that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. Now here's, here's what I think happened. I think the word of the Lord comes to this woman. And he says, get ready, you're going to entertain company. And she goes to her cupboard and she says, Lord, I don't even have enough food for me and my son. How can I entertain company? I, I know that, that I know at my house when we have company, uh, my wife does a major, you know, there's usually a grocery run, there's usually a major cleaning, there's, you know, all of these kind of things to, to make sure that we can entertain company properly. And I'm sure that's what she was doing too. And she doesn't have anything, and there's a terrible drought in the land. She's a widow, so she doesn't have anyone to provide for. And apparently her son is a little boy, so he's not able to provide for. And so she's just like, she says, we're going we're, we're gonna to go in, we're going to eat our last meal, and then we're going to starve to death. And she's like, I don't know, I mean, I, your, your God wants me to take care of you, and here you are, and I'll give you what I have, but what am I supposed to do? And so he says there, verse 13, Elijah said, said unto her, Fear not. Isn't that great? He knew where she was coming from. Don't be afraid. You're scared. You're scared because you're looking at what you can do. You're scared because you're looking at your coverage. You're looking at your provision, at your resources, at your strength, at your abilities. I promise you, every single time. When you and I focus on what we can do, we're going to get scared. I don't know about you, but uh, uh, so there are times that I lay in there at night and I go to thinking, you know, what if, <laughs> what if this and this and this, and, and usually it's after, you know, we have some friends or some family that have something happen to them and you go, oh my gosh, what if, you know, that they, they came out of this because they had good insurance or they had this or that, or they had made provision for this or that, or, or they, were, <clears throat> they were independently wealthy. And so when this difficult time happened, you know, but it's always going to, I mean, how many resources can you have? How much preparation can you make? How many things can you anticipate for what might happen? And listen, in Israel, one of the worst things that could ever happen to a group of people is a drought, especially a prolonged drought. We're talking three and a half years. Okay, so, so we've seen it as we read the book of, of Exodus. We see the, the, the drought that lasts seven years and how devastating it was. And how, I mean, it basically enslaved the entire world to the Pharaoh as a result of that devastating drought. And so, so this, is, this is where the widow's going to start learning now. And Elijah tells her, fear not. And that's what God says to us as well. God has not given us a spirit of fear power and of love and of a sound mind when you and I face these situations and listen here's the other thing about this chapter you're going to face these situations you're going to face droughts and difficulties and layoffs and and sicknesses and and I mean just just think of all the, the things that that could happen you're gonna face those in life okay but God wants us to face them with faith and not with fear and so he says to her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first. First, bring it unto me, and after make for thee and for thy son. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel. 
The barrel of mill shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. So there it is. Don't be afraid. Here's what God says. And don't you know that that was something? I'm sure that first day she she was like, "All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna we're gonna deal with today." And that's by the way, that's all you've got, and that is the way that you and I should face all of these kinds of things. We're gonna deal with today. So she goes and she makes him a little cake first. Listen, even in our darkest, most difficult times, don't forget to think of others. Take care of other people, and God will take care of you. And that's kind of part of the lesson here. But he tells her, he says, your little barrel of meal is not going to, it's not going to waste. And your little cruise of oil is not going to run dry. Not till the rains come. God says so. So she makes a choice. Okay, I'm going to do it. So she goes and makes a cake. They have a little little piece of bread that night, a little drink of water. They go to bed. Verse 15, And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah, and she and he and her house did eat many days. And don't you know after three or four days that that next morning when she got up after she used all the meal that she had except for just some crumbs down there, and, and she's sitting there like this trying to get enough oil out of there, and she's just got the, 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 the part that stuck to the sides of the, of the jar. And she set it down there. She got up next morning and went in there, and she... Lifted the lid off, knowing what was she going to find? Just those same crumbs she'd seen the night before, and she lifted it up and looked in there. And I wonder how full. I wonder if God filled it all the way up. I bet He did. I bet it. I bet it was like half full. What do you think? I, I mean, how, how many? You know, two cups. I, when I make biscuits, that's what I use. I use two cups of flour. I don't know. About two cups worth, four cups worth. She she peeks in there. She takes that lid off. She peeks, and there's enough to make bread for that day. And she looks at the jar of oil. She picks it up. And there's enough to make bread for that day. So she makes bread again. And after about day three or four, I bet you she was getting out of bed. Woo-hoo! Going there. What God do today? Look at that. I mean, wouldn't you? I mean, how exciting. How wonderful. Never have. I mean, this is better than ordering your groceries online. I mean, it just shows up. And so, verse 16. The barrel of meal wasted not. Neither did the cruise of oil fail according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Elijah. And this is so exciting and so awesome and wonderful. And we should quit right here because tragedy strikes. And every single time. And see, here's the deal. And this is this is what we got to learn. <clears throat> We're talking about sources now. She had to learn that God was her source as well. I'm going to make my last cake. Me and my son, we're going to die. No, you're not going to die. Don't be afraid. God's going to take care of you because it's not that jar of meal. It's not a husband who can provide. It's not the prophet. He brought nothing. He's another mouth to feed. He's a problem. God added to her problem. It's God. He's the source. God's the source. God's the source. But for a widow woman who has a son, that's her insurance policy. As this boy grows, He's going to be old enough soon to be able to become a man. And when he does, he'll take care of his mama. He's very important in her, in her life. And so it says in verse 17, It came to pass after these things, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick. I don't know exactly how long, but it wasn't long and sickness hits. Listen, it's going to hit. I mean, every time we pray, who do we pray for? Sick people. It's going to hit. It's going to hit our families. It's going to hit us. And sure enough, it does. And it was so sore, there was no breath left in him. And she said unto Elijah, What have I to do with thee, O thou man of God? Art thou come unto me to call my sin to remembrance and to slay my son? Now, I don't know what that's referring to. She is a Gentile woman. Maybe she's talking about her previous idolatry. Maybe it has something to do with the death of her husband. Maybe it has something to do with, well, who knows? Who, who knows what it is? But just like most of us, when something terrible and awful happens like this, she experiences guilt. And she says, you know, what have I to do? You're a godly man, and, and God has just brought you into my life to show me my sin and to basically rub my nose in it. And folks, that's not what God does. Will God allow consequences in our life to draw us to himself? Yes. Yes, he does. But God is not 
gloating over this. He's not punishing her in some way here, I don't think. It just is one of those things that happens. But she's, she's on top of the world. God is providing for her in a miraculous way. And this blessing has come because Elijah has come to her house. And I think what happens is, is she gets a little confused as to who her source is. Because it, she's thinking it's Elijah. Do you remember the guy we studied, Micah, who had the house of idols in the book of Judges? Remember how when he had his own idol and his own priest, he had that Levite that was his own priest, and he said, now God is blessing me because I have my own idol, I've got my own priest, and I'm thinking that maybe that's kind of the way she was. Elijah was kind of like a good luck charm for her. As long as Elijah's staying here, everything's going to be good. But you know, one of the things that we've got to all realize is, is that difficult times are going to come. We're going to experience death in our families. We're going to experience loss. We're going to experience uh, 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 challenges of all different kinds. And, and we, we shouldn't really, <coughs> we are, but we shouldn't really be surprised when they come. As a matter of fact, the New Testament tells us specifically not to be discouraged or surprised. Count it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, right, in the book of James. Because it's an opportunity for God to build patience, to build faith within us. It's an opportunity to pray. And so, so while she's experiencing guilt and she's basically having a bad time, Elijah is going to remain calm and he's going to do what we all should do when we encounter difficulty. And that is, he's going to pray. So verse 19, he said unto her, give me thy son. He took him out of her bosom, carried him up into the loft where he abode, and laid him upon his own bed, and he cried unto the Lord, and said, O Lord my God, hast thou also brought evil upon the widow with whom I sojourned by slaying her son? And he stretched himself upon the child three times, and cried unto the Lord, and said, O Lord my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come into him again. And so, I don't, I don't know why he stretched himself upon the child. Uh, and and I, I literally have read dozens of commentaries on this and I've never heard anybody say anything good about it I mean nobody knows no I mean I think I think it's Elijah's absolute desperation he is desperate he is broken he is uh, he doesn't know what to do but he knows where to go and so he cries out to God I would encourage you sometime to just do a little study on that phrase, cry out to God, and see how many times the Bible uses that. I don't think that Elijah was over there nicely whispering calmly to God. I think he was hysterically screaming as he throws himself on this child. Oh, God, please raise this child. Please. Okay? Now, Elijah's a man of God. Elijah's a man of prayer. And it says in verse 22, The Lord heard the voice of, the, of Elijah. And the soul of the child came into him again, and he revived. And so, so this, this whole thing is, is trying to, to teach us, Elijah, Israel, the woman, who's the source? God's the source. God's the source. Uh, not, not your your way that you live your life, not the people that are in your life, not your source of income. God's the source. And so Elijah knows how to go to the source. And Elijah took the child and he brought him down out of the chamber into the house and delivered him unto his mother. And Elijah said, See thy son living. And the woman said to Elijah, Now by this I know that thou art a man of God and that the word of the Lord in thy mouth is truth. I wonder if she didn't know before. <laughs> I think I would have figured it out with the meal and the oil, but but you know this is this is one of the the things that God does sometimes is He builds faith, and I think that's what He was doing. This woman knew about God, and this woman had had even probably understood because God says I have commanded this woman to take care of you that she had heard from God in some way, and certainly while Elijah's hanging out there and staying at her house and they're having meals together, surely he's teaching her about God through this whole process. But boy, oh boy, 
You know, tonight as we rejoiced and celebrated at the beginning of all of the answers to prayer that we have received of people and things that we've prayed for right here, our, our little church, doesn't that just build faith within you? I mean, doesn't it make you just, you know, when you, when you look back, we talked about it uh, the, a few weeks ago, when you remember what God has done in the past, the mighty things that God has done, it encourages you to continue to trust God and to continue to pray. And so, so as we, as we think about this, I, I just want to encourage all of us tonight, God is our source. You know, uh, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Your job is not your source. Your mental capacity is not your source. Your ability to work is not your source. Your college degree is not your source. Your training and experience is not your source. God is your source. And, and don't ever forget that. And when you do forget that, get back, in, <laughs> get back in this book and be reminded once again that God is your source. And uh, I... I uh, I want us to uh, turn real quick to the book of James. We're going to close with this, James chapter 5. And I just want to leave with this. As we study the prophet Elijah, don't ever forget this. <clears throat> Every time I read Elijah, I just think, man, man, what a guy. What a, you know, I mean, I mean, if, if Bible characters wore capes, Elijah has a cape on and a big S on his chest, you know, I mean, just incredible things and this is just a couple of them here we're going to see more but it says there in verse 16 of james 5 the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much elias that's elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are that means that elijah was a sinful person like us he got excited about things he got frustrated about things he was passionate about certain things uh he probably was a guy who uh, liked good food and raven sandwiches and cakes made in uh, Zidon probably weren't part of his list. He was probably, you know, kind of Italian in nature and liked lots of spices and things like that. So, so I, I, I mean, he wasn't a happy-go-lucky guy all the time. He had bad days. He, he lost his temper. He was moody, he, whatever, right? But it says he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. He prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. He was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed. The effectual fervent prayer of Elijah accomplished much, it availed much, and the affectionate fervent prayers of you, doesn't matter how old you are, all you got to do is know Jesus. Whosoever, he says, We'll speak into this mountain. Whoever you are, if you are a believer, whoever believeth in me, greater these works that I do and greater works than these shall he do. We looked at both of those passages of Scripture. You don't have to be some super saint to pray super prayers. You just need to be a believer who believes in a mighty, awesome, powerful, prayer-answering God. And so I just want to encourage you tonight. Don't ever stop praying. Don't ever stop believing. And, uh, and just, just keep your focus on the source. God, he's the source. Amen? Amen. Amen. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the word of God. And thank you for our church, Lord. God, we, we pray that you would continue to use us in these days. Lord, we want to we wanna see the harvest being white. We want to be used by you to let our light shine before men. God, in our places of work and in our homes and our neighborhoods and our schools and our, in our places of play and, and the, the, the places that we go, we pray, God, you'd use us. And we pray that we'd never forget that you are our source for everything that we need. You'll provide for us just like you did Elijah if necessary. And, and God, we just uh, we trust you tonight. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. I love you. I'm glad you're here.